Okay, welcome back, everybody. Those of you driving, please be very careful. Okay, I've had a few students who are driving. So don't watch me, watch the road. <laughs> All right, just be careful out there. All right, well, welcome back. Um, we are going to knock out chapter nine, get that out of the way. Don't forget next Tuesday is the uh, next exam. So if I haven't moved the due dates for some assignments, not to worry, I'll get that moved over. So like I stated before, nothing is due until uh, we are done with that chat. Okay, any questions before I begin? Well, let us begin with where, where we ended. Okay, we've been, this chapter deals with uh, were acids and bases, okay? We had talked about, see, we ended up on uh, page seven here. We were talking about um, the different types of acids, definitions, as you say. We had the arrhenius acid, and that is where uh, any a compound will, on dissociation, when placed in water, dissociates to form a proton and a proton, okay? Now, note something here. These acids start off as covalent compounds. Okay, Hydrochloric acid, HCl, is a covalent compound. The basis, as per the Arrhenius definition, is any species, when put in solution, dissociates and produces a hydroxide ion. Hydroxide is the polyatomic ion, one of the ones you, uh, that are in your table. Notice here that these uh, bases are ionic compounds, okay? Earlier I stated that normally covalent compounds do not dissociate, and that's a true statement, unless they are an acid, okay? An acid will dissociate. That's the nature of the beast for a particular acid, meaning that it's a covalent compound that dissociates to produce ions, okay? The uh, ionic compounds start off as ions and then go into solution. Now, some of these guys, these ionic compounds, will dissolve 100%, totally go in solution. Some, not as much. And we're going to have more on that in a bit here. Okay. The, then I introduced, we introduced the first reaction that we're going to talk about of the sixth eventually. This is the first one called a neutralization reaction, all right? And that is HCl, which produces a proton because it's acidic, and sodium hydroxide, which produces a hydroxide ion because it's producing the OH as per Arrhenius definition. And when a proton and a hydroxide ion combine, they neutralize each other and form water, okay? And they form water. Hence, a neutralization reaction. So next time you have a little bit of an acid stomach going on, you take a Toms or you take Maalox, you are ingesting a base. This is what you're drinking, a base, which is neutralizing the excess acid or the acid in your stomach, okay? All right. Then we have a second definition, which has, as far as the, um, called the Bronsted-Lowry. Now they're, they're similar with respect to defining a, a, a proton as an acid. And, you know, uh, tomato, tomato, <laughs> Bronsted-Lowry says you lose a proton. Arrhenius says you produce a proton. Either way, you're dealing with a proton, right? Where they differ though, is how they define a base. And, and a Bronsted-Lowry base has nothing to do with sodium hydroxide, okay? In fact, it, it in, encompasses a lot more compounds that can be classified as bases because what they do is they render they render that proton neutralized, just like a base. And they do that by the fact that a lot of the uh, uh, Bronsted-Lowry bases have, we call your Lewis dot structure, have lone pair of electrons there. And the proton with that empty orbital forms a bond with that to generate that polyatomic ion of which we did as far as the Lewis dot structure, this structure that we received, 
Okay, we have the bracket so far in the charge. And so that ammonia complexes with that proton to form this salt, the ammonium chloride in this case. Okay. Again, in effect, neutralizing the proton, but it encompasses a lot more, uh, stretches the definition of a base as far as other compounds. And, and in general, compounds that have lone pair electrons can act as a brown Lowry base. All right, so then we, we stopped here. So we're gonna define strong acids and strong bases. Now, the thing about how we define strong acids and strong bases is real straightforward. It is the extent by which they dissociate. If an acid or base dissociates literally 100%, it is a strong acid because there's a lot more ions in solution. If it doesn't, if it's be much less, you know, one to 5%, then you have a weak acid or a weak base. Plain and simple, okay? Nothing complicated, okay? Because if I were to take pure 100% water, and I immerse this water sample with a what's called a conductivity instrument, which is basically just the instrument that measures to see if that solution can conduct electricity. And what I, normally, if we were in the lab, we'll have this little instrument that we immerse, has a little LED, very simple setup, LED readout. And if there's no ions in the solution, then the LED doesn't light up because there are no ions in there to, to close the circuit. It's like a light switch, a light, you flip it off, the electricity doesn't flow through the electric lights. Turn the switch on, boom, you close the circuit. And so uh, anything that produces ions in solution will be, co be conductor. So a strong acid or a strong base essentially dissolves 100%, will have a lot more ions and therefore that little LED rail readout will be very bright compared to a weak base and a weak acid, which will have a smaller amount of ions, they will conduct electricity, but the intensity of the LED readout will be less because the amount of ions are, is much less, okay? So with respect to acids, uh, just learn these three here. HCl is hydrochloric acid, okay? This is hydrochloric acid, acid HCl. This one's called nitric acid. I'll have a, a list of this in a minute. Nitric acid, and this is called uh, sulfuric acid. Okay. This is hydrochloric acid. Now I want you to hydrochloric acid. Now I want you to make note of something. Let's take this one here, nitric acid. Now, if I take nitric acid and I place it in water, it will dissociate 100%. And the fact is this, it will produce, notice here the way it's written, that acids in general have the eight hydrogen written first and followed by whatever else is attached or whatever else the molecule, okay? So it will produce a proton. And guess what? Does this look familiar? This is the nitrate ion, okay? The nitrate ion from the polyatomic ion table. This is the proton, okay? Now, if we look at sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, and we do the same thing, it produces two protons because there's two protons attached to sulfuric acid, plus the corresponding anion, which hopefully looks familiar, SO4 negative two, that is the sulfate. So all of these polyatomic ion anions at one point came from an acid, which then reacted with a base to form the corresponding salt, in this case, the sulfate and the nitrate, okay? All right, so either way, all of these are strong acids. So when they dissociate in water, they break apart literally 100%, okay? Literally, and I say literally because nothing's 100%, 99.99%. So it's a very strong, and if we had that little conductivity sensor in the solution, that LED light would just light up bright because there's so many ions in solution. These ions are important all over, all over the place, even in your body. Electrical signals 
being sent from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes cannot occur or wouldn't occur without the fact that there are ions in, in your body that can carry that electrical current from point A to point B, okay? Now, with respect to strong bases, as de by definition, anything that produces a Arrhenius, Arrhenius um, excuse me, produces a hydroxide uh, polyatomic ion is considered a base. Now, what governs the strength of bases is the solubility of the base. We will learn from the solubility rules. So you might say, what rules are those? Well, right, I'm glad you asked. If you go to the periodic table on the bottom right side, there's a table called solubility rules. We're gonna go over those in a bit. There's two columns. The far left column is soluble. The far right column is insoluble. If the compound is called, is considered soluble, it's literally 100% dissolved, okay? Dissociate. If it's considered insoluble, even though it's, it's classified as insoluble, remember the, the majority will be intact, but there will be a small amount still in solution, making it a weak solution. So bases are governed, the strength of the base are governed by their respective solubility. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide are um, very soluble and therefore strong bases. Okay. Now, if we're going to depict this in the diagram, uh, beaker diagram, we will show it as, as, as follows. Okay. For example, before we can draw anything, we first have to determine whether the, the compound is strong or weak. Now, for this example, hydrochloric acid is one of the strong acids we just explained. Okay. One of the three, this is one of the, uh, the strong ones which means that if I wanted to write a diagram to demonstrate that, I would put everybody in ionic form, okay? And don't forget, pair them up. Obviously, we got like three pair here. Now, you can put three or four pair of ions in the solution, and that would designate it as written as a strong base. So by looking at it, you can conclude that the way it's written, because they're all separated into ions or a strong base, a strong acid. With respect to a strong base, it's a similar scenario. Once we determine that it is soluble in water, okay, that means that 100% dissociation. So then we write at least three or four pairs of ions all separated with their respective charges. So this, in this case, the left uh, diagram which demonstrate a strong acid, why? Because we got protons. Protons would tell us we got an acid in here. And the right, will sh and they're all separated. And the right will show us, uh, depict a strong base. Why? Because we got hydroxide in solution. Strong because they're all totally dissociated. Okay. All right. So some of the strong acids I just explained was hydrochloric acid. All right. Nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Now, the strong bases are those that are soluble, all right? So if we go to the periodic table, we go to the shapes table, okay? I want you to look at entry number one on the left column. What this, like I said, you got two columns here. This is the soluble column. Number one, look at the three, four cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium ion, okay? Whatever anion is attached to that, those cations, they are classified as soluble. That means that the hydroxides that are attached to lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium are soluble, therefore strong bases, okay? And so here we only show uh, uh, three of them, but you can add the ammonium hydroxide and add the lithium hydroxide. Why? Because the solubility rules tell us that the sodium, potassium, ammonium, and lithium make whatever they are, are attached to. All the thousands and thousands of anions that are out there, they're classified as being soluble. And since they're attached to hydroxide, it makes it into a base, 
they're considered a strong basis. Okay, and that's what I mean by bases are, are governed by the solubility rules. Okay, with respect to acids, you just just got to know that those three there are, are classified as strong, strong acids. Okay. And that's what we, when we mean strong again, it just uh, being uh, producing a large number of ions in solution. Now, counter to that is weak ones, okay? And here are four weak ones. Okay, the first one, is um, HF, which is called, you know, HCl was called hydrochloric acid. This one would be called hydrofluoric acid. Okay. Uh, and if you ever stained glass, you have a hobby or play with staining glass, you probably have some HF in, in, in your chemicals. You, know, you use that quite a bit for that. The next one is Carbonic acid, carbonic acid, and if you drink a lot of soda pop like I do, or you drink carbonated water, you probably you you have you have drunk some carbonic acid, okay. And then the, the next one, which is a little bit difficult to see what that is, is the general formula, and H C two H three. If you like Italian dressing, then you, you ingest quite a bit of this then. This is acetic acid, AKA vinegar, okay? And then the next one is H3PO4, which again, like, so, like carbonic acid found in soda pop quite a bit, this is called phosphoric acid, okay? Notice the corresponding anion for that. Does that look familiar? The carbonate. And for this guy here, phosphoric acid, the corresponding anion is the phosphate, okay? So that's what I mean by uh, the, a lot of those polyatomic anions come from initially from an, uh, an acid that was reacted with a base to generate that. So if I put, if I take the three hydrogens off, I create phosphate. If I put the three hydrogens back in, I have phosphoric acid. Okay. Same is true with the carbonate. Okay. Now, as stated, these are weak acids, and therefore we depict these. In, a, in this uh, reaction by the double arrow, okay? Which means that it's going in both directions. The rate going forward is the same as the rate going backwards, but these are weak. So maybe about 95% of that material is still intact, okay? Whereas the other 5% is distributed amongst the two ions. So that's what we mean by being weak. There's not a lot of ions in solution. And if we do do the conductivity test on that, it would light up, excuse me, it would light up, but the, the intensity of the LED light would be very small, okay? It would be very dull. And how do we, how do we uh, show that graphically? Okay, well, HF is a weak acid. And so we have a beaker of HF and notice, Normally what happens to, to designate a weak acid, we generally just put up one pair of ions, okay? Because it's weak, and, and so there's not a lot of ions in solution. The rest of the ions, that we, the material that we put in there, are the intact molecule, okay? There's no charge, okay? There's no charge in nature. Second of all, these acids where if the weak acids are intact, they're in solution. So they're not really falling down. They're kind of moved all over the solution. They're not really like a solid material. They're just floating around in the solution here. Now, with respect to a weak base, same process, meaning that it doesn't totally dissolve. We have a double arrow here. Okay, again, 95% of it could be in the form of the intact molecule. Now, how we, de 
pick that in a, in a beaker diagram is that follows. Down in the bottom, we got this that kind of uh, kind of demonstrate that the majority of the magnesium hydroxide has precipitated down to the bottom of the container and sitting there in the solid material. If you ever looked at a, a clear bottle of magnesium, uh, milk of magnesia, okay, let us sit, then you'll see the white material fall to the bottom. And that is the active ingredient, which doesn't have a lot of solubility in, in solution. You're gonna mix it up, okay? So that would be what we call a precipitate. And what we do is we then show one set of ions. And we have two hydroxides, of course, because the formula tells us we've got two hydroxides for every uh, ion of magnesium plus two. Okay, so that would demonstrate and depict a weak base. Okay, how do we know it's a weak base? Because it's got hydroxide in solution, small number that is. How do we know it's an acid on the other side? Because we've got a proton in solution. Okay, now the reason we know it's a weak base is because of solubility. And we send you two back to the solubility. And if we look on the right side, this is the inside. Now look at number 10 here. Okay, we're talking about the hydroxide ion. If the hydroxide ion is bonded to any of this big four here, lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and bonded to calcium, strontium, barium, that's what? Four, five, seven examples of hydroxide compounds that are soluble. The other 10,000 hydroxide compounds are insoluble. Okay. And so magnesium is in the insoluble category. And that's why we, we put uh, it. And to designate that, we put an S right here to show that it's in, insoluble by solubility rules, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a little bit of ions in solution, which we do, okay? All right. Now, overall, we talked about the weak acid summarized. We got the hydrofluoric acid, the carbonic acid, phosphoric acid, and acetic acid. So those, those four, just just learn them, you recognize them and their formula and their name, okay, as far as the acid. With respect to the bases, which are ionic compounds, their weakness is defined as, um, uh, and they're defined by their solubility. And so just like I just did earlier, there's only seven hydroxide examples where you have a strong base because they are soluble. So everything else, every other metal bonded to hydroxide would be a weak base because it, is, uh, it shows to be insoluble. Okay, again, weak is just simply the quantity of ions in solution. And so here you might have uh, some diagrams where they're asking you to demonstrate weak to pick which one's a strong acid. Well, first of all, we can see here that all of them are acids, all these beakers of acids. Why? Because we're producing the proton. This one here, there's no proton D. So definitely this is not an acid, nor is it a base. It's probably some covalent compound, okay? So it's near an acid base because we don't have any hydroxide in here, but we do have protons. Okay, so the strong one would definitely be A, because look, everything is separated. All the ions are there. Nothing's shown, depicted as being together, unlike B and C. But you can see that, yes, the majority of the HA is shown to be together. And then we got two sets of uh, the ions. Looking at the um, C, we got one set of ions, okay? So both B and C would be weak, and I could even further extrapolate more information from B and C and say that of, of B and C, B is probably a little bit stronger than C simply because there's more protons in solution, more ions in solution. 
Okay. Okay. So none with respect to base grid, no hydroxide. All right. So which brings us to the scale, the pH scale. I'm sure you've heard someplace somewhere in your life about the pH. You got a swimming pool at home, you're probably checking the pH. You've got the aquatic life at home, you're probably checking the pH of your water. Okay. Now, pH is a numerical scale. Uh, it runs from zero to 14. Okay. Is our scale? Neutral, neutral is seven. So anything greater, greater than seven is in the basic category. Alkaline cat. If something is, has shows alkalinity, it has a pH greater than seven. Anything less than seven is in the acidic uh, domain. Okay. Now within those two domains, there's uh, a range. It can go from zero to to you know six point nine. You know we got weakly acidic somewhere between two and six and so forth. Your stomach is eh, varies about one to two very strongly acidic. On the basic side, um, let's see if you ever use some liquid plumber at home to unplug your, your kitchen drain or bathroom drain, that pH is somewhere in the order of 12 to 13, very, very alkaline, very strong. Okay. Now we're going to introduce a, another unit here called molarity, and we designate that by these brackets here. Okay. And that is called molarity. Now, we're not going to get in much detail at this point, but we will later on. And molarity has the units of moles per liter, volume, okay, specifically liter. It's analogous to density. Remember density, grams per volume, grams per milliliter. Well, this one has a units called moles per liter. We're going to learn how to how to calculate moles. Every every species, every chemical compound has moles involved here. Okay. So what this is saying down at the bottom that if if the concentration of the proton is greater than the concentration of the hydroxide, then it's acidic. Okay. When the concentration of the proton equals the concentration of the hydroxide, guess what? We are in the neutral strength. We're 7 pH. And then when the hydroxide concentration gets greater than the proton concentration, then we are now in the basic domain, it becomes basic. Okay. And that's a summary there. So we got units of moles per liter and we'll come back there. We're gonna learn how to calculate molarity, not in this chapter, but in subsequent chapters, okay? But basically, uh, when the acid concentration is greater in the base, it's acidic and vice versa. All right, now, how, we, how do we calculate pH? Well, pH is nothing more than a mathematical calculation. So we take the concentration of the proton, the acid concentration, and we take the log of it, okay? So on your calculator, you get a button called log, you click that. What you get back most of the time is a negative number, okay? And if you multiply that negative number times a negative, you end up with a positive number. So you, we, we, normally, we normally will work with um, always pH as being a positive. It is feasible to get negative numbers, but not often. So what's happening here is if we take the pH of, let's say, we take negative, which is negative one, times the log. Uh, let's say the concentration is uh, uh, 10 to the negative one, one times 10 to the negative one. We can input it in either scientific notation or longhand, either way. What you get here is negative 10 to the negative one is one, okay? Negative one times one, guess what? Is positive one. So the pH of a, a uh, ion, a proton concentration of 0.1 moles per liter has a pH of one, which is acidic, very acidic. It's in the order of where your stomach is sitting there pH-wise, okay? 
And if you ever need to go back the other way, is there's you use this relation mathematical relationship. You cut from the pH, what is the concentration? So you input the pH, there's a button in your calculator, it's 10 to the X power. If you take push that and type in 10 to the negative one, okay, you get point, point 0.1. Okay, it's going the other direction, going back to concentration. All right, so if we take the concentration one time sent to the negative fifth, it's pH pretty straightforward, is a, is a five, five pH, still acidic, not quite neutral, but it's getting to be mildly acidic, okay? 10 to the negative eight would give us a concentration of, excuse me, a pH of eight. Okay, now we're in the alkaline side. Okay, we're in the slightly uh, uh, basic side. 10 to the negative third, pH back to the acid side, somewhere in the order of uh, vinegar. Vinegar has a pH around eight, so three, excuse me. Okay, and here we can either type it in longhand, decimal way, or convert it to scientific notation. Either way, you're gonna get the same answer. Okay, so 0.001, or 10 to, 10 to negative three is still pH three. And also with this, 10 to the negative eight is also the pH of eight, okay? So either way. Now, normally you're gonna have a number like uh, one times 10 to whatever X power, and, and that's pretty straightforward. But if you ever get a number, you need to calculate the pH 2.3, times 10 to the fifth, negative fifth, then yes, you would have to use your, your log button on your calculator, which is pretty cool because it used to be you had to look up the log in using tables, which was bad. <laughs> anyway, here are some pH values of some common items we're familiar with. Vomit obviously close to two, depends. On the person, but you know it makes sense that you know your stomach juices are coming up very strong pH. They may juice around two saliva that varies from person to person. All the biological pHs tend to vary depends on your diet, your health, and so forth. Saliva around uh, seven. The blood is pretty consistent, about seven point four, seven point three ish. You know, very crucial type of uh, pH that we'll talk about here briefly. Milk and magnesia, alkaline, 10 and a half, and so forth. Urine, again, dependent on diet and, and metabolism and so forth. On the average, it's slightly acidic. And then uh, some of the salt drinks. And I was surprised that uh, root beer had a, had a mildly acidic uh, character, 5.5. Okay. Which brings us to both. Now, I'm not going to say much about both, but simply state what it is, is, is a, a acid in the base system that will help maintain a specific pH that you want to maintain, okay? And we have pH buffers for the whole pH range. So you put them together and sometimes you need to run a reaction if you're doing chemistry, you have to run it under a certain pH. Well, then you create a buffer so you can maintain that pH. And what a buffer does is that Whenever an external acid comes in, while well, the basic part of the buffer will react with that external acid to help maintain the pH and vice versa. If an external base comes in, then the acid part of the buffer will react with the base and the, and the strive is to maintain that pH. For example, I mentioned earlier, your, your, your pH in your blood, 7.4, very crucial pH governed by sodium bicarbonate in your blood system and even the, the breathing, the carbon dioxide intake coming in. Very crucial, your body striving all the time to maintain that pH, otherwise, big problem, okay? So that's a buffer. This buffer system is just to keep that pH constant. All right, so here, uh, the question is kind of fill in the blanks to give you a reaction. Okay, and then you might ask, well, wait a minute, how do I know what's what? All right, like I stated before, nine times out of 10, you got a formula and you got hydrogen written first. You can 90, 95%, 99% of the time think acid, okay? 
unlike water, because by convention, they write H2O, but uh, that would infer that it's an acid, but it's not the case. It's just by convention, everybody in writing like that now is stuck. So we got hydrogen out first, so that should indicate um, an acid, okay? And then you got the rest of the NO3, and then keep it in mind, your all atomic ions, NO3, that could also kind of help you out. Yeah, great, great, all right? The parentheses here tells you, okay, I got a polyatomic ion, specifically I have the hydroxide, okay? which again tells me it is a base. All right, so from the Arrhenius definition, the, eight, the nitric acid is the Arrhenius acid because it produces a proton. And then the calcium hydroxide is the Arrhenius base, okay? Because it produces a hydroxide in solution. Now, Keep in mind here, something else you should look at this equation, this ring. It is, quote, balanced for you already. Okay, what we mean by balance is that based on the law of conservation of matter, that if you have an X number of atoms on the reactant side, you're going to have the same number, of those same numbers, of those atoms on the product side. So you have to balance it. If we're not creating matter here, all we're doing is moving it around to be in the different forms. So you would notice here that there's a two in front of nitric acid, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is kind of break it up into the ions so you can see the full picture. So we have two nitric acids. So when it goes in solution, it's gonna produce two protons, okay? And two nitrate ions, okay? Calcium will produce a calcium ion, and then there's two hydroxides that are produced, okay? Then, as it reacts, it's gonna produce two molecules of water, and it will produce the calcium and two nitrate ions, okay? so. As I stated before, we showed in the beginning that a proton reacting with hydroxide will produce water. So these two protons will react with these two hydroxides to guess what? Make two molecules of water, hence the two. Hence the two in front of nitric acid, okay? Then the, we got one calcium here as a reactant, and guess what? We have one calcium as a product, okay? We have two nitrates in, to begin with, and guess what? We have two nitrates to end up with. So atom-wise, it is balanced. And we need to know that information because down the road, we need to, once we take a sentence of a reaction, and then we're gonna figure out what type of reaction it is to determine the product, then we're gonna balance it, okay? And once we balance it correctly, we're going to be able to do calculations. So we can, for example, if I start off with 10 grams of, say, nitric acid, can, I need to calculate how many grams of calcium nitrate I create. And I can't do it without having a balanced chemical reaction. Because the ratio between nitric acid and calcium is a 2 to 1. And we have to take that into account. Okay. All right, so that demonstrates here uh, balancing. You can see that everything, all the atoms are accounted for, okay? And of course, we know that you know, there's two nitrates on calcium because calcium is a group two at, at, uh, metal and we have a plus two charge. All right. right, in this exercise, they want you to draw these beaker diagrams of these particular chemicals. HNO3, HF, KOH, and MGOH, okay? Well, some of these we talked about already, but before we do anything, let's say none of these we talked about before. So the first step here is to determine whether it is a strong acid, if it's an acid, or a weak acid, if it's an acid, and then determine if it's a strong 
uh, base or a weak base based on solubility. We know that HNO4, nitric acid, is strong acid. Okay, so we're basically going to get 100% dissociation. Okay. Uh, HF is one of the weak acids we talked about. So, you know, you're going to get probably maybe, you know, very weak. So I just put one to 5% dissociation to demonstrate, to remind me when I draw the papers to keep the HF majority of them intact. Potassium hydroxide, this is ionic compound. So that directs me to the solubility table. And potassium is one of the, the big four, which makes it soluble which then tells me it's strong, 100% dissociated because it is very soluble in water. We do the same thing for magnesium, and this would be magnesium hydroxide, would be a weak, specifically weak base. Strong base up here because we're dealing with hydroxide, okay? Weak base, you know, just to make track, keep track of it for me, one to 5%, okay, double arrow. The bulk of it would mean it would be intact, right? With a few ions in solution. So that is what we do first. We define what category they belong to. So then we can draw the proper drawing. So we have HNO3, which we just defined as a strong acid. And so therefore now I can draw a set of ions, at least, you know, three to four, three to five, uh, uh, sets of ions here, but the point is that all separated. So don't forget, they're all dissociated, and being dissociated, they have their respective charges. Don't forget that. Okay, you just can't put hydrogen up there with nothing, nor you can put nitrate up there with no charge. Okay, these are ions. We got an equal pair, a set. We got a set of three here, so it should be three nitrates and three protons. Totally separated, indicating a strong acid. Okay. HF we denoted earlier as a weak acid. Okay. And so all we do is actually just put one set of ions together. That's all we got to do. And then add about, you know, I don't know, three or five of the paired molecules. They're paired because they are not, the bulk of this material is, is still intact. They haven't dissociated because it's weak, okay? Also note that they're not sitting at the bottom of the beaker. They're floating around uh, in the solution, but they're intact. Calcium hydroxide, we denoted, we determined that that was uh, soluble in water, so therefore it is strong. So we just set up, you know, uh, at least three to five pair of the potassium hydroxide ions, potassium and hydroxide. The magnesium hydroxide, based on a solubility rule, shows it to be insoluble. Okay, so we will put an S there to show it is sol insoluble, which means that. To show that graphically, we put the bulk of it down in here in the bottom to kind of show that the bulk of the magnesium hydroxide dropped to the bottom of the beaker, okay? Because it's insoluble. So this is like the milk and magnesia scenario. But at least show one set of ions in solution because even though it's classified as insoluble, there's still some ions in solution because it is a weak, weak, what we call electrolyte. Okay, so summarize all this with respect to Arrhenius. Um, Arrhenius acids produce ions, protons, okay, in water. The bases produce the hydroxide ions in water, polyatomic ion in water, compared to the bronze acid, which is, they define it as losing the proton. So, all right, so you lose a proton. Either way, you got a proton involved, be it Arrhenius or Brocellon. Where they differ is the base. The base normally 
our molecules that have lone pair of electrons that will have that can attach and complex with the proton to neutralize that proton. Okay, so that includes a lot more, a lot more examples. Strong acids, they totally ionize 100% uh, ballpark, you know, and that's why they're strong compared to weak ones that, that do not. The bulk of the weak acids are still intact. We have a few ions in solution. And um, strong bases, normally these are ionic compounds, and that is governed, the, the strength is governed by the solubility. So if a strong base is shown to be soluble, then it will be a very strong electrolyte and dissociate 100%. If it shows based on the solubility rules that it is insoluble, then it is considered a weak base, okay? Uh, and then buffers, their whole function is to maintain whatever pH you set it at to be constant, to maintain that pH. All right, some examples of some soda pops to give you an idea. Uh, so, you know, my Diet Coke, I drink a lot of that, 3.289 pH, you know, pretty, um, pretty city. Uh, one thing, I, I some place was, I forget where I read this, but somebody was reporting pHs of 50 and 60, and I'm like, oh, I just, it's it just, that wouldn't be a case because you really could, you don't have the instrumentation to even, detect those low pH, those pHs that high, or vice versa, down in the negative values. So a pH is, the values normally are running between 0 and 14. You see anything greater, especially in the 20s and 30s, be quite skeptical. And second of all, if they report pHs in other than non-aqueous system, systems, then again, be skeptical. Okay, because most the majority of the time, apples to apples, your pH is measured in aqueous systems. And that's why you gotta be careful about your, the amount of quantity of acidic material. All right, so this brings us to the solubility rules, which I kind of briefly touch on, but I wanna get a little more, little more uh, uh, detailed information. Uh, point number one, the solubility rules are based on 25 degrees Celsius because solubility is really a function of temperature. I can get things to go into solution by simply heating up the solution. But then, you know, now I can't compare apples to apples. Now I've you know, got a different system. So all of the solubility rules are based on 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. If the table says that it is soluble, classified soluble, then uh, basically, 100% of it goes completely in solution. Keep it in mind, it should be an approximate. Nothing's, nothing's ever 100%, but pretty close. And what we do to designate that something is soluble with respect to the physical state, we add in parentheses on the right side is uh, parentheses AQ, showing that it is soluble in the aqueous system. Okay. Now, if the rules tell us that it is insoluble, then we designate the physical state as S, meaning a solid. But keep it in mind that even though it is considered insoluble, there is a small percentage that is of those of that material in solution and that have dissociated. Okay. It is very weakly. Okay, so we have the table here. And like I said, we break it up into two columns. Column on the left, first of all, number one, okay? Lithium, sodium, potassium, and the ammonium cations. Whatever anion they are attached to, regardless of what it is. So all 10,000 whatever anions that exist out there, if they are partnered up with any of these four, that material is always soluble in solution, okay? Soluble, soluble in solution precipitates 100% very strong electrolyte, okay? When we talk about the acetate ion and the nitrate ion, 
These come respectively from acetic acid and nitric acid. These particular ions, regardless of what cation they are attached to, all of 10,000 other cations that are out there, those species are always soluble, okay? All the time. Now here we get a lot of, not 100, not always the case. Number four, we call the halide, specifically the chlorine, chloride, the bromide, and the ammonia. Normally, all of the 10,000 other cations out there, metal cations, they are soluble unless, unless they are attached to silver, mercury, or lead. And so what we have here is 369. There are nine halide examples that are considered insoluble, okay? Silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide, same with mercury, and there's nine of them, insoluble, okay? The sulfate, normally all the sulfates are soluble regardless of the cation, except calcium sulfate, strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, silver sulfate, and lead sulfate. One, two, three, four, five. There are only five species that are insoluble, five sulfate species that are insoluble. Everybody else, it's attached to anything else cation-wise is soluble, okay? See how that works? All right, now let's look in the right column. Normally this is the insoluble, okay? When you see the carbonate, something carbonate, you can think insoluble, except for four species, when they are attached to the big four here. Lithium carbonate, sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate, ammonium carbonate, those are soluble. All the other 10,000 examples of carbonates are insoluble. The same is true with the chromate ion. Lithium chromate, sodium chromate, potassium chromate, ammonium chromate normally are, in, are uh, soluble and the other 10,000 are insoluble. Sorry if I sound redundant, but I, I want to make sure you, 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 you got there. Same is true with phosphate, okay? There's only four species of phosphate that are soluble. Everything else that phosphate is attached to, metal-wise, okay? We're talking about ionic compounds, is um, considered soluble, insoluble, anything else except those four. Okay, and then we can do the same thing with the sulfide. The sulfide, everything else it's bonded to is in, uh, insoluble except the big four and on top of that, calcium, strontium, and barium. So there's four, five, six, seven. There are seven examples of sulfide ionic compounds that are soluble all the 10,000 other more, whatever number there is of sulfites are insoluble, okay? And then we do the same thing with the hydroxide. The hy hydroxides, normally insoluble, except also with seven, also with the big four and calcium and strontium and hydroxide. So there's also seven examples of hydroxide compounds that are soluble and all the other 10,000 are insoluble, okay? Insoluble. So that's how the solubility rules uh, work so that you can, wait, where do you go? Let me clear this up a little bit. So if we look at these examples down here, They'll say, okay, determine whether this is soluble or insoluble. Well, let's take a look at this. You got sodium written right off the top. So you don't have to go any further. Why? Because sodium is part of the big four. And so is potassium. 
okay? That means that those guys right there are soluble and therefore we write AQ, meaning they are soluble, okay? The next one is a hydroxide. The hydroxide's right here, number five, okay? Normally insoluble, except the big four and these other three, of which aluminum is not of those seven. So therefore, aluminum oxide, hydroxide, excuse me, is insoluble. So we put an S there, okay? So along the road, this is a weak electrolyte, weak because not a lot of it's insoluble. Same, same thing with silver, silver bromide. Normally the, the silver halides are right here. Normally they're soluble, except when they are attached to silver. So silver bromide is insoluble. And then we got calcium carbonate. Normally the carbonates, unless they're, they're attached to the, to the big form, and carbonates are insoluble, okay? Unless they're attached to the big four of them. So calcium carbonate is insoluble. That's also known as ring around the tub. You get a tub, you got some cakey material on there. Most of the time, that's with the calcium and carbonate material there. Right, and finally, we did do the potassium. Potassium makes it soluble. And so, let me uh, clear this up here. And so if, if we were going to draw diagrams, for example, of these species, and then we had a beaker, you know, here, you know, I, I would draw everybody as ions because everything is soluble, okay? Aluminum hydroxide, I would have a big chunk in the bottom of aluminum hydroxide, and then I would have a one set of hydroxides in solution with my charges. The same with silver bromide, big chunk in the bottom, there would be silver bromide in the bottom, but then I would have at least one set of ions in solution. And the same is true with the calcium carbonate, big chunk of it down at the bottom because it's insoluble, but one calcium set in solution, okay? And then the potassium nitrate, since it's, um, I can, you know, draw three potassium pluses and three nitrates and do that, that's acceptable. That just demonstrate that everybody is um, soluble and everybody's in solution. Okay, so which brings us to electrolytes and and basically, again, electrolytes are nothing more than these elements that have gone into solution because they are ionic. They're either cations or anions, okay? And, and things like anything that's a soluble inorganic compound, things that are strong electrolytes, that are very good conductors of electricity, and because they completely ionized in water. So, Soluble ionic compounds, all the strong acids, the strong bases, completely dissociate, very strong electrolytes and will conduct electricity very strongly, okay? And non-electrolytes are species that are covalent compounds that do not dissociate, excluding the covalent acids, okay? That means that all the other covalent compounds, they remain intact, they do not dissociate. I've seen pictures, diagrams, where people have taken water and broken it up into the ions. Well, that's not correct. Water remains as water. It does not dissociate, okay? So things like water and carbon monoxide, and then that C6H12O6, that's the general formula for a, a, a sugar. So, but there, the point is, is all of them are covalent compounds. None of them are an, an acid. And then the weak electrolytes, so those are poor conductors of electricity. And so all the weak acids, the weak bases, and anything that's insoluble, classified as insoluble ionic compounds, are, are considered weak electrolytes, okay? And basically that kind of summarizes everything I just mentioned there, okay? 
strong electrolyte, strong base, strong acid, soluble ionic compounds, weak electrolyte, weak acid, weak base, or insoluble ionic compounds. And the non-electrolytes are all the covalent compounds except the acids, okay? The covalent acid. Uh, this kind of demonstrates that conductivity aspect of it. You have here is a beaker with two uh, rods in there electrodes with a positive end and a negative end. And if you have, if you have uh, ions in that solution, then you are going to get a closing the circuit and that's gonna uh, light up if you had a bulb up on top. So that little arrow represents electricity is being run through that. And think of those ions as a light switch because if you didn't have those ions, then your light switch is off. If you have covalent compounds, they do not carry they do not carry a charge and therefore no electricity is being passed through here and, and non-conductors. All right, in this example, what they're doing is um, giving you a diagram and then determine whether it is strong, weak or not, okay? Well, let's take a look at the first beaker. The fact that we see dump down here, <laughs> it's sitting at the bottom, automatically should tell you, hey, I got a weak, weak solution of something, right? You can go back and figure out what that something is. This is a weak base, you know, AKA weak electrolyte, okay? Now we look over here at the next one, we have nothing but carbon and hydrogen, that that's implies and doesn't imply, it tells you it's a covalent compound, okay? So this would be a non-electrolyte. No electricity will flow through that solution, okay? And then we look at potassium chloride. The fact that, you know, that potassium is part of the, the big four there with respect to solubility, then everything goes in, into solution. And all you see here are just ions, negative and positive, nothing combined. So definitely this is strong. Strong electrolyte because of the solubility of potassium chloride. Okay. Now, taking these here, uh, you're asked to figure out, is it a strong, weak or non-electrolyte? Well, we got barium sulfide. Well, we got to look up sulfides and find out if it's soluble or insoluble. And it turns out that barium sulfide is classified as soluble, okay? even though uh, all the other sulfides are considered, that's a number nine, that's on the right side of the solubility table. Even though all of these sulfides are classified as insoluble, there's a limited number of sulfides that are soluble and barium is one. Silver chloride, as per number four on the left-hand side, silver, you got the chlorides normally are soluble except when they are bonded with the heavy metals. And when I mean heavy metals, I'm talking about mercury and lead, okay? Silver, heavy metals. So this is a weak electrolyte because of its insolubility. Number three, you see potassium right up front. You don't have to go any further, it's part of, part of the big four. So automatically, you know, it's soluble regardless of what follows. And it's being soluble, it makes it a strong electrolyte because it is soluble. H2CO3, okay, the H2, the hydrogen first, could flag you to say, wow, well, this must be an acid. Check on your list for acids, weak and strong. You'll see that this is a weak acid. Therefore, it is a weak electrolyte, okay? Carbon dioxide, no metal here, no hydrogen here, strictly carbon and oxygen, strictly covalent. Therefore, a non-electrolyte who does not conduct electricity. Number six, you got sodium hydroxide, no sodium part of the big four, right? Automatically soluble, strong electrolyte because it's a strong base and it's a strong base because it is soluble. And we've got calcium carbonate. If you look at the carbonate column, you'll see that this one is specifically 
insoluble, which then makes it a weak electrode. Number eight is made up of nothing but um, car uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, nothing else. So therefore I have a covalent compound, which makes it a non-electrolyte. And then number nine, the fact we got sodium again, like number six, don't need to go any further. It is a strong electrolyte because it is soluble, classified as soluble. And then PBSO4. The fact that you see PB, lead, you think, hell, oh, heavy metals, right? Heavy metals can be a problem. And in general, heavy metals are insoluble. But to verify it, go check up, check the sulfate, and you'll find that sulfates are uh, normally soluble, it's on the left side of the column, except when they are bonded to the heavy metals of uh, silver and uh, lead and barium, strontium, cal and calcium, okay? So it is a weak electrolyte because it is insoluble. And so to, to look at a list of chemicals, you first have to recognize what they are, okay? All right. And once you recognize what they are, uh, determine, look at the uh, inner, um, ionic compounds. If they're ionic compounds, then look up their solubility, okay? If they're acids, then look up on your list whether it's a weak acid or strong acid. So that, if, and if there's no hydroxides involved and there's no proton that you can think of, then they must be covalent. And if they're covalent, they're, they're not conductors of electricity, they're non electrolytes. Okay, because, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Chapter nine down. <laughs> we got about, uh, what, six more. Yeah. All right, well, that does it, and I even had seven minutes to spare. I hope I didn't go too fast. So, 